So we started on Friday, we spoke about the Kodesh HaKadoshim and the Aaron. So this is in fact a bit of an interesting picture, but just to give us an idea, it's interesting, the Kruvim, everything that a person tries to describe in the Beis HaMikdash is very hard to make any type of description of it. But most of all is the Kruvim, which uh, there's, there's no real way of being able to know much about it at all. But uh, let's try and learn a little bit what we do know about it, in addition to what we learned the other day. And um, and let's see what we can uh, what we can deal with it. Okay. So yesterday on Friday we learned about the fact that the Arain was in the exact center of the Beis Hamikdash. So, for example, if you measured the Arain and you measured the width of the Arain, which actually the Arain was, its length was from north to south. Its width was here from east to west. You measure the width of the Arain, you have one and a half Amis. If you measure the length of the Arain, you have two and a half Amis. The height, of course, is one and a half Amis. The Arain is sitting, as you see this stone, this is supposed to be the picture of the Evan Shasia. The entire Kodesh HaKadoshim, the entire room from east, from east to west is 20 Amis, from north to south is 20 Amis. And we mentioned this on Friday, just to go through that point again. If you measured it, then you didn't see the space of the Aaron, because if you measured from the Aaron, from the wall of the Aaron, till the wall is 10 Amis, from this wall of the Aaron till the wall is 10 Amis, and this wall till the wall is 10 Amis, and this wall till the wall is 10 Amis. Now, if I'm measuring from wall to wall, it's 20 Amis and 20 Amis. Where did the two and a half Amma of the Aaron and the one and a half Amma with the Aaron, where did it go? And that's what the Gemara tells us, The Arain was a space above space. Now the amazing concept of this is for a very simple point. The Rajba writes a very interesting thing. It's a philosophical concept, but it's a very interesting and understandable idea. If a person says to you that Hashem is supernatural. He's beyond nature. Great. Hashem is beyond nature. Meaning, nature is that the water in the river is water. Hashem can change it into blood. Hashem is beyond nature. He created nature. He can change nature. In our minds, it doesn't make sense that someone can change water into blood. But we realize that there is an almighty, there's a creator who is beyond nature and he can do that. That's called Nimna. He can split the ocean, he can split the sea, that it doesn't go from up, down, it splits. The water stands like walls. That's Nimna, that's an impossible thing. But the creator can do something that's impossible and that's almost makes sense to us. Miracles make sense to us because if he created nature, he can also go beyond nature. But then there's something called nimna ha nimnois. Nimna nimnois means something that even in our minds, we can't even think that the creator can do such a thing. And that is to put two opposites together. The fact that he can go beyond nature makes sense. But to be able to have nature and beyond nature at the same time, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't work. In our minds, that's nimna nimnois, that's impossible. 
that the creator could make someone be riding on a animal and not riding at the same time, either or. He can't, he can make you be beyond the world. He can make you not be riding the world. He can make you not be riding by the laws of nature, but he can't make you be doing both at once because it's impossible. You can't have two things in the same space. If they both take up space, if they don't, then you can. So now for someone to say that I measure the Aaron, the Aaron doesn't take up space. It looks like it takes up space. It doesn't really take up space because it's something spiritual. I can grasp that. I understand that just like there's things that are limited in space, there's things that are beyond space. For someone to say that the Kaidish HaKadoshim, despite the fact that it's the holiest place in the world, nevertheless, it takes up space. There's 20 Amis and 20 Amis. That makes sense because God created nature. Nature is limited in the realms of time and space. So if I measure the Kaidish HaKadoshim from wall to wall, and I see 20 Amis, and I know that there's a space of the Aaron which doesn't take up space, that's called spirituality. That goes, that's fine. If I know that there's an Aaron that runs, but that this place takes up 20 Amis, that works. If I measure the Aaron and I see that it takes up space, that works. If I measure till the wall and from the wall, and at the same time I measure the Aaron and I see that the Aaron is taking up space and yet not taking up space at the same time. That's what happens in Kaida Chakadashim. That's what's demanded of us in our lives. Everybody knows that Hashem runs the world. Some things aren't the way I would like them to be. But I know that it's coming from Hashem. And I know that Hashem is the one controlling it. And therefore, He has my best interest in mind. That's the measurement of the Kaida Chakadashim 20 by 20. God runs nature. Then there's something else called faith, bitachin, trust, that I know that Hashem, even if it doesn't, there's no way in the world, in my mind, that I can be saved from the issue that's happening in my life, whether it's God forbid sickness or a lack of parnasa or whatever it may be. I see no way in the natural world I can be saved from it. But I know that God is above nature. That's measuring the wall from here to here, from here to here, seeing there's 10, seeing there's no space for the Aaron. It's supernatural. That a person can understand that Hashem can do anything. He can change nature. But to feel that in, on one hand, I have to live within the realms of the natural world, which means I have to be careful. I have to do things. I have to act in the natural world in a way to save myself from sickness, to save myself from other issues. I have to try and be involved in the world. And at the same time, have a hundred percent trust that despite the fact that what happened yesterday and wasn't revealed good came from Hashem, I have no doubt in my mind that now Hashem will give me something which will be revealed good. That doesn't make sense. And that's what's demanded and what's enabled for a Jew. Another idea, Gallus and not Gallus. For a person to say, we live in Gallus now because Hashem put us here. And therefore, right now in these three weeks, there are certain things that we don't do as a sign of mourning for the destruction of the Beis Amikdash for the fact that we're in Gallus. We don't listen to music. We don't make a Shekhyana. We don't buy new clothing, etc. Makes sense. How could we be in Gallus if Hashem runs the world? Because he decided to put us in Gallus. To go on the other hand and say, I believe with complete faith that in truth, spiritually, there really is a base of Mikdash, and that really the light of Mashiach is already in the world, just waiting for me to recognize it and draw it into my life. That's supernatural, but then maybe I shouldn't be mourning. To say that at the same time I'm mourning because Shulchan Aruch tells me to mourn 
and I'm mourning the base of Mikdash, and at the same time, I'm living with the reality that a Jew is really above Golis. That doesn't make sense. But that's something that's demanded of a Jew. And here we see another interesting point with the Yaren. When the Goyim came to destroy the Beis HaMikdash, they came into the Kodesh HaKadashim. Think about it. What were the Goyim looking for in the Kodesh HaKadashim? The whole world at that time worshipped idols. They believed in a God that I can see with my eyes. If I want to worship something, I'm worshiping something I can see. We look at it as ridiculous. How can you bow down to a stone? They looked at it as ridiculous. How can you worship a God that you can't see? I have to be able to relate to it. The stone represents a spiritual energy that's coming from some star or the or constellation or whatever it may be. But in order for me to worship something, I can only be limited to the limitations of my physical understanding. That's the way they understood it. They built big temples for their idols. Inside the inner sanctuary of their temple, they had the idol, which is what they worshipped. They understood how you can build a temple for an idol which you can see and feel came along the Jewish people, or didn't come along, the Jewish people were there before them, but they looked at this one strange nation in the world that worships an invisible God. Doesn't make sense. If you're worshiping an invisible God, how can you worship something you can't see, you can't relate to? But more than that, they saw that the Jewish people, they have a temple for this invisible God. And they said, well, what's in that temple? What's inside the inner sanctuary of their temple? What do they have there if their God is invisible? Why are they building a temple for him? This is the impossibility of space beyond space. If you just worship an invisible God in heaven, they may not relate to that, but they can understand that there is such a thing. But to worship an invisible God in a physical world, in physical realms of the physical world, that doesn't work. How does that happen? If it's spiritual, it's spiritual. There's no temple with rules and laws and where can you go, where can't you go? What should you do? What should, the same thing with the whole Yiddishkeit. Judaism is based on time and space. It should transcend time and space. That's something they couldn't relate to. And when they came into the Beis HaMikdash, they wanted to see what is it? What do the Jews have? And they saw something, officially the Oren wasn't there, and that's actually something amazing. The Gemara asked the question. The Gemara gives the answer. How, what? It wasn't really the Kruvim of the Oren. There was a picture on the wall of the Holy of Holies. There was a engraving of Kruvim. Still doesn't really work fully. And in fact, the real answer is that when we're talking about the Kaidish HaKadoshim, it could be that it's not there and it is there at the same time. And they sent out to all the nations of the world, they said, do you know what the Jewish people worship? Do you know what's inside their Holy of Holies? These people who are the most spiritual people who their blessing is a blessing and their curse is a curse and their words mean something because they're spiritual and yet what do they have inside their holiest place? They have statues of a boy and a girl hugging. How does that work? They were shocked. But in order to understand what it's really all about, let's look at the idea as we know the boy and the girl represent Hashem and the Jewish people and it shows the love between Hashem and the Jewish people. But the question is something deeper. We know that at the time of the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash, we know that always the Kruvim miraculously when Hashem and the Jewish people, when the Jewish people were doing what they were supposed to do, 
So Hashem's love was revealed to them. The Kruvim were hugging each other. When the Jewish people were not serving Hashem the way they were supposed to do, they were facing the wall, they were facing back to back. Here was the lowest time of history, the Beis Mikdash is being destroyed. Why are the Kruvim having, hugging each other? And the answer is that in this place where there's space that's above space, in this place where nothing makes sense, the ultimate gallus is revealed for what it really is, which is the ultimate love of Hashem, but usually that's not revealed. In the deepest place, it's revealed. Even in the time of gallus, it's revealed that Hashem is not destroying the Beis HaMikdash to destroy the Beis HaMikdash. He wants to build the third Beis HaMikdash, so he has to destroy the second. Usually it's not revealed. We're mourning now in the three weeks. But we know that deep there in the Kaidash HaKadashim, over there it's revealed. And that's why there's another aspect in the Holy of Holies. And the other aspect is that this is the only thing, the only part, the only vessel of the Beis HaMikdash that the Beis HaMikdash can manage without is the most important one, the Aaron. A Minaira you need, otherwise you don't have a Beis HaMikdash. Perhaps if it's, you don't have it, it still is a Beis HaMikdash, but originally at least when you build a Beis HaMikdash, you need a Minaira. You need a Shulchan. You need the inner Mizbech and you definitely need the outer Mizbech. You need a Kiyar. You need all of the utensils. What don't you need? The Arin. The entire time of the second Beis HaMikdash, there was no Arin. The most important part of the Beis HaMikdash. And the reason is because this is something which is in space and above space. When Shleima Melech built the Beis HaMikdash, he built the Holy of Holies in the back and deep down under in the ground, in a tunnel, in a deep windy tunnel, he made a place which he sanctified as the same Kodesh HaKadoshim and he said, there'll be a revealed place for the Aaron, there'll be a hidden place for the Aaron. In fact, the Aaron is the only part, the only utensil, seemingly the only one that was missing in the entire time of the second base of Mikdash and a large time of the first base of Mikdash. In truth, it's the opposite. It's the only part of the Beis HaMikdash which still remains in its place because the place under was sanctified as a Kodesh HaKadosh and just like the place on top. So now wherever we are, we could be in Golos, but our Aran, the presence of Hashem, the love between Hashem and the Jewish people is not only there spiritually like the rest of the Beis HaMikdash. The Aran is there physically and it's in a place which is equally the Kodesh HaKadoshim because there's a Kodesh HaKadoshim above earth and there's a Kodesh HaKadoshim in the bowels of the earth. And this Kodesh HaKadoshim, the one deep inside the earth is, the Rambam says that it's in deep windy paths, which means when there's windy paths which cause sin, that cause destruction, that cause gallus, that reaches the deep, the depths of the soul of a Jew and brings out the true yearning and the true connection that a Jew has to Hashem no matter what. It reveals and brings out the love between Hashem and the Jewish people and the Jewish people and Hashem, which is constant and always there. And on the contrary, because of the lack and because of the deep windy paths, that brings it out even more and that enables there to be the coming back of the art in the third base of Mikdash. And that's the ultimate something which we have in our time, especially now, when it's the three weeks and we're mourning the base of Mikdash on one hand. And on the other hand, the Rebbe gives us a whole new outlook and says, don't just mourn the base of Mikdash. Learn about it. Don't just yearn for it. Prepare for it. The three weeks of destruction means that's when Hashem broke down the old Beis HaMikdash because he wanted to build a new one. And that's why it says in the Medrash, Allah Aryeh b'mazol Aryeh v'hechri v'aril. Nebuchadnezzar is called a lion. He came in the mazel of lion, the constellation of lion, which is the month of Av they were about to enter. He destroyed Ariel, the Beis HaMikdash. For what reason? Al-Menas in order, Sheyavai Aryeh, that Hashem was also called a lion. 
should come also in Mazel Arya because he transforms our, our mourning into joy and build the base of Mikdash. That all comes together. And just to end up one point, that that's why there's an interesting argument between Rashi and the Ramban regarding the faces of the Kruger. The Ramban says the faces of the Kruger were the faces of angels. The Ramban was a spiritual, his books are Kabbalistic books. He says the place where Hashem rests his presence, that's the angels of God. Rashi, who wrote this simple explanation of Chumash, says that the faces of the Kruvim were faces of school children. Because it's in the simplicity of the child, the simplicity of the simple Jew, more than the greatest angel, that's where godliness is revealed. And that revelation of godliness is unchanging in a changing world. It's not just unchanging because it's spiritual, it's unchanging, but it remains in the physical realm of the physical world until it's revealed fully in the third base of Mikdash, when at that time it's not going to be just like it was in the first and second that the Kohen Gadol goes in once a year. In the third base of Mikdash, every single Jew will go into the Holy of Holies every single day whenever they want. They'll prepare themselves, they'll come in because that oneness, that unity is going to be revealed for all at all times. Okay. Uh, tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much.